Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of thefutureofads.com. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of the digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss the intersection of social, local, and mobile. Our goal is to help you understand these topics so you can integrate them into your marketing and advertising. Today is April 24th, 2012, and this is episode number 16. In this episode, we'll be discussing Google Drive, Domino's mobile apps, mobile video apps, Pinterest marketing programs, interesting uses for Facebook timeline, and much, much more. So stay tuned. How's it going, Adam? It's going all right, Corey. How are you doing? I am doing well. It's been a good week so far. Yeah, we were discussing, I could swear it was only last week where we were discussing like rain torrenting off of your roof and and uh, um, how wet it was out here in the Bay Area. Or maybe it was the week before, but then this last weekend was like, I mean, record heat and everybody was sweating and you and I were talking about heat stroke a moment ago before we started. <laughs> yeah, I actually managed to get heat stroke over the weekend, which was kind of crazy. I guess uh, I went out for a hike and... Got a little a little warm and a little dehydrated, so it ended up not feeling good Saturday evening, but recovered from that now and ready to conquer the week. Though from what I hear, the rain's coming back tomorrow and uh, tomorrow and Thursday, bring your umbrella. So setting ourselves up for a good weekend, but for the for the meantime it's supposed to be a little rough. I guess that's what matters, huh? If it, as long as we have a good weekend. But uh, I, I had looked at my um, you know, my iPhone at the weather, I think it was Monday. And I'm like, what's going on? It was like two suns, then two clouds with rains, and then two two uh, suns with clouds, and the 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 temperature was just all over the place, and it was uh, it was so random. It was uh, it's just it's really uh, it's really confusing to say the least, especially when you want to finally go out and dress in some shorts or you know more casual attire during the day instead of having to wear a jacket all the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, what do you say we dive into this week's news? A lot to cover. A lot of interesting things going on. The first of which is the announcement from Google of their Google Drive at long last. Uh, and even Google kind of made a nod to the fact that this has been rumored and speculated about and uh, sort of buzzed about behind closed doors for a while now with their, their announcement blog post. And... Um, You know, it's something that enters a crowded marketplace. There's things like Dropbox and Apple's iCloud that are already sort of established in this space. But it's Google's attempt at creating a cloud drive system. And it integrates into Docs and really brings together a number of their online properties and allows you to sync offline. And eventually, though surprisingly not at launch, sync with mobile, including iOS. So they said they're... Google Drive iOS app is apparently 98% done, which makes me wonder why didn't they just wait for the other 2%? But, you know, that's that's nitpicking a little bit. They got to get it out there and get started somewhere. So um, are you going to be a Google Drive user? Are you a happy Dropbox uh, convert that's not looking astray from from your Dropbox methods? Or what's your situation, Adam? Uh I don't think I'm gonna. I don't think I'm gonna stray from Dropbox per se. Uh, I, I think how I look at this when they release a whole bunch of you know, and I say a whole bunch because you know beyond Google Drive, there was also the Sky Drive from Microsoft that was released this uh, this week uh, or about a week ago. Um, I think as soon as all these competitors jump in, what happens is is it um, it's always good for the consumer. There's options, and and everybody else. Um, who, who's been out there, like say Dropbox, has to kind of think a little bit and innovate and find a way to differentiate themselves. So the the only downside right now with Dropbox really is is that for their like fifty gigabyte plan, I think, which is the one I'm using, it's like ninety nine dollars. Um, yeah. And when you look at some of the other uh, uh, tools out there, you've got, for instance, Google Drive, which I think for that same uh, that same amount of um, room would be, I think like a, a quarter of that or something or half of that. It's, I mean, it's really significantly a, a, a lot less, uh, but they're really not all apples to apples. I, I mean, the, when you look at say Google plus and, and even sky drive, uh, they very much integrate with the, their own, you know, uh, tools um, and kind of ecosystems. You've got Microsoft office, obviously for, for Microsoft, uh, you've got Google Docs for Google, and then and then they do actually tie it into um, their social network at Google Plus and um, and also in, in Gmail. Um, and so 
I do use Google Docs. I don't use it in a real let's say organized fashion, so to speak. I mean, I have my documents, some documents up there. I really use it more conveniently as a way to make sure that a few things that I want to grab are available. Uh, you know, things that are not super important are available at all times if they were initially sent to me in Gmail, because that's what I use as my inbox. Um, but really, I still think that Dropbox is kind of the most uh, convenient and ubiquitous as well. Um, what do you, what about you? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because it feels like a competitor to part of what Dropbox offers. So the idea of having a folder that syncs across your computers, but at the same time, because it doesn't yet have a lot of the API functionality and app connections that Dropbox has established, it doesn't yet work as the sort of file system for the cloud that Dropbox is going after. So I have a lot of applications now, especially on the iPhone and the iPad, that just automatically save documents into and out of Dropbox. It's really a seamless process, and that allows me to have those available wherever I go and where, uh, wherever I happen to be, versus Google Drive for the moment is just a place to access your Google Docs and then sync files from computer to computer, but it doesn't have that app integration that I think is really key to launch a significant competitor to Dropbox. Actually, you know, it, it does have some app integration already on launch, but not not very, you know, not broadly like Dropbox does. Hmm. Um, it was it was it was interesting because I didn't I haven't really had a chance to fully get into it and and really see um, how I was going to kind of tie it into things because it does appear initially to just be part of Google Docs. Um, but if you look at the blog post, which we'll link to in the show notes, you'll actually see uh, a few uh, descriptions about um, different things you could do with Drive. And, and one of the things they kind of mentioned in there that caught my eye was they were linking to the words um, create website mocks or website wireframes. And I was thinking, well, why are they linking to this in here? And what does this have to do with with the standard kind of Google Docs thing? And I clicked on it and found that there was a um, there's a p- very popular website and in user interface kind of wireframing tool called Balsamic uh, Mocks, and um, previously it was kind of a desktop application. And what it looks like they did on launch is they actually created a a Chrome or a, or a Drive uh, compatible. Uh, app so that now if you want in addition to just saying I want to create a new Excel document or not Excel but a you know Google Docs spreadsheet or Google Docs presentation or Google Docs document I can also click now and by adding that app to Google Drive I can now immediately create a balsamic mock directly from Google Drive uh, and it will now be synced up across you know, all of my drive uh, to my drive account wherever it is that I'm using it and so if you go to the Chrome App Store um, you'll actually find that there are a number of drive specific or drive compatible services that are out there. And I've actually installed about three of them that I haven't had a chance to test drive yet. Um, but like you said, like Dropbox right now is kind of like everywhere, mm-hmm. um, in- integrated with all these applications. But I-, I can see the strategy that Google is going for. And I think it won't be long before um, we'll, we'll see it in a lot of, uh, a lot of our, our favorite tools and even some that we've never even thought of or heard of. Yeah, interesting. And it also made me wonder, so I installed this Google Drive on one of my computers and let it sync and it loads up all these files. And they have like .g doc extensions and whatever the extension is for their Google spreadsheets and their Google Pages applications. And it got me thinking, you know, well, on my desktop, I don't really have anything to edit these files with. But I wonder if there's something in the works from Google that would sort of be a desktop office replacement where you could actually edit these files and it would handle those Google specific extensions and do so in a in a native Google way. Um, and maybe that's just offline capabilities for their existing online apps. Uh, that's sort of one option that they could take, but it would be interesting to see them launch a actual suite of desktop tools that you could interact with some of these files with. Yeah, I think we'll we'll probably end up covering it a little bit more in the future if we find uh, uh, find some some interesting uh, uh, you know additional features come out that we think would be useful to our listeners. Yeah, definitely. And 
One, you know, specific nod to how marketers and advertisers could use this is that I've actually been using a shared Google spreadsheet for quite some time as a way of managing an editorial calendar for both myself and a client that we co-manage a Facebook page with. So this is a combination of kind of brain dump or, you know, way for us to gather notes and ideas for future topics that we want to talk about, and then turn those ideas into specific posts that then get outlined into an editorial calendar. And what's nice about it is that both of us can access it at the same time. We can both make changes. We can both review things. And so it really becomes a collaborative document. So if you have a small team and you're looking for an easy and free way to get everybody on the same page and create an editorial calendar and be able to make notes and you know say, hey, this, this was something that was created by team member A and now team member B can give their feedback and team member C can approve it and team member D can post it. You know, all of that can actually run through something like a shared document um, that could be shared with a number of these services. You could have, you know, a shared Word document that's uh, synced into a shared Dropbox account, or you could run it through Google Drive like I've been doing. Um, So I think there's a number of ways to do it, and oftentimes it's just kind of catering it to your own needs. But it is an interesting way to kind of create your own tool versus something like a, you know, a co-tweet or something like that that's out there that works very well, but also has a a monthly or yearly cost associated with it versus something like a Google Doc, a shared spreadsheet uh, is either going to be very low cost or oftentimes free uh, as long as you're willing to put in a little bit of the legwork to set it up to suit your needs. Yeah, and to to end it all, you know, you just you asked about whether or not I would uh, say shy away from from Dropbox. I think that's the most interesting case for using something like a Google Google Docs is because um, it's web based collaboration happening in real time. So it's not only just a place to store something, uh, but for instance, when we were doing the um, TEDx San Jose um, marketing here in the Bay Area um, for the event for 2012, which happened a couple weeks ago, we worked with um, with with a PR organization, actually Ogilvy in this case, and uh, we were able to collaborate. Us being on directly on the team and them being uh, on the uh, you know our, our PR uh, our PR team to actually create a collaborative. Um, what we called a, a conversation calendar, similar to a, 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 an editorial calendar, all directly online, and we can actually all collaborate, you know, right there. And it's not about, for instance, with Dropbox, you, you have that document, you save it. After it's saved, then it ends up going and syncing back to Dropbox, and then the other folks have to, you know, then open it up or, or uh, in, in order to make their changes or whatever. Having it directly online on Google Docs is everybody can see it right at the same time and actually see the changes happening in in real time. And that's what I think is is important to being able to collaborate uh, and not have to worry about whether the file goes down into a folder and then syncs back to everybody and who has it open and who doesn't have it open. Uh, and so for those types of uses, um, that's where Google Docs really um, shines the most. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of good tips and something to look at for those that are managing anywhere from small to potentially large teams of folks that are trying to collaborate and synchronize across documents. Sure thing. What's up next? Uh, I think there were a couple of different tools that you had been using recently, and maybe you could provide a review of those. What your thoughts on them are, potential uses, maybe some challenges you've been facing. Um, how's that sound? Yeah, um, there's two tools I want to cover here today, and I'm hoping that we can do this a little bit more often because we don't often get to do it. Uh, but there, uh, one is is new, and one is 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 kind of old. I think it's been around for quite some time here, about a, about a year or two. Uh, but one is a Twitter app called Buffer App, and actually, I, I won't even say it's a, a, tw- a Twitter app. It initially started off as a Twitter app, uh, and really now it includes uh, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, and so, what Buffer App is, and and the name is is implying is that. Um, normally, if you find great content, you want to share it on the on those social no- networks I mentioned. You just kind of immediately do it, and that's because you don't really have a good way to manage, um, you know, capturing that content and then 
putting it out later unless you use, you know, maybe something like a hoot suite or whatever, but that's still kind of, um, time consuming in a, in of itself where you have to go and you have to schedule the exact date and the exact time you want to send it out and everything. It's just not necessarily always as convenient as you would like it to be. Um, with buffer app, you create a kind of what they call it, you know, a buffer between the times that you end up tweeting or, or sharing something on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, and so what you do, if you initially sign up, uh, the, the basic one is free. The basic buffer app uh, account is free and you get up to 10 slots essentially. Actually, you get as many slots as you need. You create actual time slots. Um, that you want to send things out on a consistent basis. So think of it as just kind of like these slots that are labeled, you know, 12 o'clock, 8 15, uh, 6 30, uh, whatever times that you want, day or night. And with the free account, you can actually pre um, queue up to 10 messages. Uh, so it's not just 10 slots, it's just you can pre queue up to 10 messages. Um, and once you reach that, they ask you, of course, you know, to pay so that you can go ahead and send out more and so on. But I found that 10 has been at least personally quite enough, uh, as long as you manage it as, as part of kind of an, an overarching strategy that you might have with, um, with, with, with other systems. Like I might still use Hootsuite for more fine tune posting. Um, and so the way that I've been using Buffer App, for instance, is uh, I find a lot of interesting content all the time, quite frequently, in fact. And in most cases, for myself and for my clients, the content is not something that should or needs to be sent out immediately. It, it, it always feels like it should be. It always feels like you want to just share at that moment. But what happens as you're going through content is you potentially share two or three or four or five great things that you find all at once. And it, it's it's a little bit of an overload for your for your followers. And in fact, uh, there's there's more of a likelihood they're going to see maybe one thing that you share, but not all those things. And so to kind of shoot all those things out at once is, is a little bit of a waste. And so what you do is you use Buffer App, you establish your time slots. And then what I've been doing, for instance, just to give you an example of me personally, is I'll go ahead to my iPad or, or someplace else where I have, um, you know, content uh, that I subscribe to. So, for instance, I use Reader on my iPad and I'll look through what's on Reader with all of the, the, the blogs that I'm interested in, the type of content that my, 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 uh, my audience and the folks that are connected to me are, are most interested in, the folks that I really want to attract and engage with. And I'll find those, those, um, those posts and then I'll end up going and pasting them and queuing them up inside Buffer App. And I'll choose, like you can choose every time you put a post up, do you want it to post to all of your networks at once or do you only want it to post to two of your three networks or one network? So, for instance, I might take a look and say, okay, I really think that this is going to be an awesome post for Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. So I'll just select all those networks and I'll throw it into the queue. Um and uh, eventually what happens is every couple of days or so, I'm able to actually fill up a couple of days worth of, you know, say three or four or five posts per day on each of the networks that just go out at kind of predetermined times. Uh, and then in the meantime, I actually am still engaging with folks in the, uh, when, when, when somebody responds to me or somebody has a question or if I find something else interesting during the day, I can still send that stuff out if I really want to. But I know that I have content going out on a frequent basis. And, and it actually also measures that it has analytics associated with it. If you use Bitly or, or are familiar with Bitly, it can uh, attach it to your Bitly account. And so you can actually track the metrics and see what kind of content uh, seems to get the best reaction. Um, and, uh, and just most recently, they've added the ability to deal with uh, images. So if you wanted to, for instance, just upload an image and send it out, uh, you could actually do that and it would host the image, you know, uh, on, I believe it's post the, the Twitter ones directly on the Twitter, uh, and, you know, Facebook directly on the Facebook and so on. So, uh, it's pretty interesting. Again, it's free for the, for the, you know, bottom barrel version, uh, and, uh, the higher, the pro version as they have it is, uh, is like, uh, I think only like $10, uh, which you can then also use to, to handle a lot more social networks. The, the basic one is only three social networks and 10 slots. Um, and so 
Uh, at any rate, I think um, it's it's something very interesting to use to kind of get a chance to measure what you are putting out there and also pace the content that you put out there on a daily basis. So I think it's one of those things you could use every single day to make sure that you always have kind of a steady stream of good good content shared with your audience. Yeah, and it feels like something that's sort of suited for or catered to those brands that are really linking out to a lot of external content. Um, have you found that to be the case? Yeah. I mean, you can, of course, use it also to time out your own content from your own, you know, uh, um, uh, whatever, wherever you're writing or wherever you happen to want to share from. I mean, obviously, if you have something on YouTube, you could share it via that as well. You know, in fact, if you have articles that have uh, – if you share, share an article on LinkedIn or, or Facebook, of course, it grabs the image and the metadata that's associated with it for those particular networks. So it, it, it really does um, – it does apply itself appropriately to, to the various networks and not just kind of here's text and here's links. And so I found it that I've gone back through, for instance, very old posts that I've written as a testing ground um, that I know have had um, a, a kind of a, a good reception from folks. And I've gone ahead and put those up there and, you know, reused my own content and have found that, um, you know, I've seen reaction. I've seen metrics that have shown me that those posts still resonate with some folks. And I might actually go a week later and put them back into my queue and share them again at a different slot time, uh, you know, with the understanding that when somebody sees it, for instance, on Twitter, they may not be there in the afternoon. They may spend more time in the morning on Twitter. So that's the audience that might have seen it the first time, uh, whereas somebody else, you know, in the evening or afternoon might have caught it the next time that I went ahead and, and shared it. Yeah. I think my only, the only thing that I'm not 100% excited about with Buffer when I checked it out initially is that you basically set very fixed windows for content to go out. So you're telling the application, you know, every Monday at 9.19 a.m. and then 11.23 a.m. and then 1.05 p.m. send out whatever the next message is in my Buffer queue but that doesn't change from day to day or from week to week. And so it feels a little forced. Like, you know, if somebody went back and looked at their timeline, they're like, oh, well, Adam posts something new every day at 1.05 p.m. And it might seem a little funky. You know, I don't know if a lot of people would notice that, but I do wish that it varied the post times a little bit within a window. So you could say, hey, you know, between 105 and 125 each day, post a new message, and then it would change that around a little bit just to give it a little bit of randomness to it. I, I think that's I think that's an interesting thought, you know. And, and the guys over at Buffer App, I, I've connected with them via email a couple times in the past when I, because they their product came out at a similar time where there was another product called Timely, I think, that came out uh, by the guys uh, over at Flowtown. Who you know, t- Flowtown's not out anymore. They moved on to a different product and Timely is still out there, but it's not really something they're working on frequently. But Timely was a little bit more about analyzing um, kind of the the most opportune times, but it was still kind of slot based. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, There's another tool real quick that you could check out called Social Flow. And that one is much, much more robust. It's also much more expensive, but I actually think it's one of the most um, interesting, effective, um, pretty incredible tools used for managing um, your tweets and and what you send out and uh, your kind of whole flow of distributing content on on the on Twitter. And it actually does analyze you when you put it into a queue. It analyzes the conversation going on around you and then outputs tweets that are in your um, in your queue based on the conversations that are happening. Uh, on Twitter. And so that's definitely a different, you know, a different beast, a different price point and so on. Um, but I don't think people notice <laughs> there's a tweet that goes out, you know, for instance, at a very specific time, all of the time. Um, 
And, uh, and so initially I was really kind of uh, averse to even doing anything automated, Yeah. but then realized that the downs, you know, there's an upside to that, right? If you are strictly just tweeting everything out the second you find it, or if you want to spend time sitting there and going, okay, well now I want to tweet that article I found three hours ago. It's just not an effective use of time. And for most people out there, most marketers, most brands, it's just a, not an effective thing to do to have somebody there, um, manually pacing stuff out. And I think that people, as long as you are still engaging with folks when, when appropriate, uh, and, and you're, you're still sharing things a little bit more organically, I don't think that it's something people notice and, and think is, um, you know, a turnoff. Yeah. I guess you bring up my other thought around a lot of these products, which is that, it sort of works if only a couple of people do it, but if everybody started to use these things, we'd all be contributing to a place that no one exists. We'd all be kind of feeding content into this land of Twitter that no one actually checks in on because we're all trying to get value out of it without actually putting a lot of time towards you know, going in there and manually posting an update and saying, hey, this is what I want to post on Twitter. I'm here. I'm behind that content. If any replies come in, I'm, you know, ready to reply back the, the moment those come in. It seems to sort of remove a little bit of that personalness to Twitter, which I think is important. And it kind of, you know, just, I can imagine the, the use of these tools growing to the point where, we're all kind of automatically posting new things, but then no one's checking it. It feels like, I guess it feels like Twitter has lost a little bit of that personal connection that it had when it first came out. And it really, every time you saw a new message go out, it was because you knew somebody was out there posting that new message. And now sometimes it feels like there is a lot of these automated content and you know, RSS feeds that just post into somebody's Twitter account and that type of thing where there isn't as much back and forth conversation going on on Twitter. And that could be due to a number of things, but I guess it just has a little bit of a, a grimy feel to me of, you know, you're, you want to get something out of Twitter, which is why you're putting content into that system, but you aren't there to actually do that content by hand and be ready to contribute to that network on an active basis. Well, and I, and I think that this is not a replacement per se for being on Twitter. And of course, you and I know that being on Twitter really in a lot of ways just means having a device connected to Twitter and being able to peek into it and, and look at it when you have a moment and you want to get something out of it, whether it be seeing the links that other folks are sharing or the discussions that are happening or the trending topics or maybe some searches that you've created for your for your brand. Um, but for instance, I'm always available to engage with folks and to talk with folks via Twitter and I get notified every single time that it happens and, and I do my best to always interact with other folks. And so I, I think buffer really is not a replacement for a large chunk of what you do, but maybe a tool to enhance only a portion of what you should be doing on Twitter. You know, it's both a balance of engagement and uh, and broadcasting. And so this is kind of the curation, the broadcasting, the thing that might um, um, continue to make you a part of the conversation and, and attract f uh, new followers because of that sort of content that you're that you're sharing. But in the end, you still need to, you know, be aware of discussions happening on Twitter and active on Twitter and uh, and actually asking organic sort of questions. But the whole thing of just simply sharing a link on on Twitter, and we're talking specifically Twitter because remember Buffer app also works with, with Facebook and LinkedIn as well. But um, the act of that sharing is really quite boring. It, it takes two seconds and you just put a link up and you share it, but you've endorsed it. You have that human factor of saying, I endorse this link. I endorse this content. I wanted to share it with my community. I just didn't want to share five of those links together at one time. Um, so I've started to kind of feel a little bit more at peace with myself, so to speak, um, after, uh, after a while, because I realized that I'm really not doing much different. I'm just sending it out at a more paced, um, um, you know, speed, um, than say, and, and, but because I'm not forgetting folks, I'm still jumping on Twitter and interacting with folks and doing all those things. Hmm. Yep. So... 
I think the other tool that you were going to talk about today is Pinnerly, and I'm going to set a challenge for you to see if you can describe your experience with Pinnerly, your thoughts about it in five minutes or less. Go. <laughs> Man, so I think that sounds like maybe the last one we, we talked about for quite some time. Uh, five minutes is plenty of time, but essentially Pinnerly, it is a new um, and still actually, I believe, in closed beta um, pin, Pinterest management and monitoring and measurement platform. Um, and so, it, you know, the premise is really, really simple. I mean, they have a few different things on there. Um, everything from, hey, here are some folks you might be interested in following on Pinterest uh, to kind of paying attention to the usual stats of like, well, how many people are following your individual boards? What's been the difference between uh, yesterday and today or, or a week ago and today in regards to how many folks are are following you on Pinterest. But the thing that I think uh, is most useful is that it has what they call com- campaigns where you can actually upload an image directly through uh, Pinnerly and pin it to Pinterest. And you add, for instance, your link, you add uh, any, you know, the, the, the description of whatever that particular pin is, you upload it and put it in whatever board you want of your own. The whole s- same thing you always do. I mean, really, Pinnerly is more kind of like a, a place where you filter it through just to add um, some some um, hooks to it that help you then afterwards measure it, um, uh, measure the impact that those, that those pins are having. Um, and so they count a few different metrics. And uh, let me grab my, my iPad real quick so I can make sure that I remember exactly what those metrics are. I, I still have time, right, Corey? Uh, you got it, but the <laughs> clock's ticking. All right, all right. Uh, let's see. Where the heck did I put that? I know that I had it up there. Now it's gone. Um, well, they, they count the same sort of metrics as you would find on, say, Twitter. So Twitter, a lot of people count reach. So if, for instance, if I've got 500 people following me on Pinterest and I'm the only one that pinned it, then they're going to say, well, the reach currently is 500, 500 people. But if, say, Corey goes ahead and he has 600 people following him and he retweets it, it's going to count and say there was a, I mean, excuse me, repins it. They're, they're going to say that there was an additional repin. And then they're going to say now the reach equals 1,100, 600 plus 500. Uh, and so they count actual click-throughs as well. So whatever URL you put, people click on the, the pin and end up going to you know whatever site or page that you ended up sending folks to through uh, the pins. And so it, it actually has reach, click-throughs, and uh, repins. And I might have something else, but I think those are the primary ones. So it'll actually show you all of those metrics and it has you know a little clean chart that shows you all that and so on. Uh, and so at the moment, uh, I went ahead and sent out three different pins just as kind of a test case. Um, I used just kind of a funny, uh, humorous, you know, uh, what do they call it? Inspirational poster type image that I found someplace. Uh, I found a really beautiful thing called the Tijuana Truck Stop Nachos. They're just awesome looking nachos, beautiful photo. <laughs> and and then uh, I shared a, p- a pin that actually I had put elsewhere already that went to my my Pinterest three ways to use Pinterest for marketing and research post where I created a custom design image strictly to put on Pinterest to try to attract traffic. And um, it was very interesting. It kind of as I expected, the food one just had like, you know, probably the last time I looked at it, it had like 45 uh, clicks and something around, you know, 15 or, or 16 repins. Uh, whereas the uh, my marketing post actually had, I don't know, maybe five or six clicks and uh, three or four uh, repins. And, and the inspirational poster, which was actually kind of funny, had the least of all those. But I was able to actually see that this time. It was easier to, man- to, 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 to monitor and to compare those things. And so Pinnerly, I believe right now, again, is in closed beta. You can sign up. You can uh, then you'll eventually they'll give you access to it, um, and I think it's it's a great place where uh, you'll you'll finally be able to experiment with a variety of pins and see what seems to be getting the most um, uh, you know getting the most traction out there in the Pinterest verse. I, I coined that term there, Corey. Oh boy. <laughs> um, and uh, I bet you nobody but me will use it. Uh, and so at any rate, I think it's, uh, it's – it's, there's a lot of other tools that are coming out like that right now. I've seen probably about four or five of them. Uh, but Pinnerly seems to be very kind of clean, uh, usable, and they're making it available to folks uh, over time. So I think it's a place to go check out. All right. Very nice. I think you made it just within the timeline. So good job. Nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, speaking of things that have to be done in a very tight timeline, Domino's Pizza. 
released an app recently. Do you like that transition? <laughs> 30 minutes or less, five minutes or less. <laughs> exactly. Domino's Pizza created a mobile app. And actually what was really interesting about this mobile app and why I thought it would be perfect for this show is it was released as a game, but actually had a number of tie-ins into other aspects of the game uh, of the business. And so when you first look at this thing, it's a it's an iOS app. I think it runs on both the iPhone and the iPad. And the goal is to make pizzas. So orders come in, you gotta you know spread the dough out, add some sauce, add the cheese, put the ingredients on in the proper order, that type of thing, and then you know click, hey, I'm done. There's here's my pizza, and then you're you're sort of doing it as fast as possible to keep all the customers happy. But what's interesting is. If you do well enough inside of this game, so you you know show up on the leaderboard or you start to really crank out these pizzas and, and aren't making a lot of mistakes and you're keeping the virtual customers happy, Domino's will actually offer to hire you in their real store. They're using this as sort of a crazy mobile digital social recruitment tool, which I think is fantastic. That's like... The craziest, you know, I, I want to be in the room where they were like, you know, I bet we could make a mobile game where we find our new pizza artists. Um, so first off, they're using this thing to recruit new employees. And then there's also a connection where you're making these pizzas inside of the game. And if after five minutes of playing, you're like, man, a pizza sounds good. You can actually use the game to order a pizza from your local Domino's and it'll shoot off your, you know, toppings and sauce and cheese of choice. And then Domino's will receive that order. And, uh, you know, 30 minutes or less later, the pizza shows up hot at your doorstep, ready for you to enjoy. So, combining yeah combining these these three very different aspects of the business from you know this brand building social game to actually online ordering to recruiting new in-store workers bringing that all together into a single mobile experience i think was just uh, a really outside the box um experiment for them to run but something that you know, shows that if you just put enough thought into it, sometimes you can really come up with an idea that that hits it out of the park. Yeah, I, I, I was, um, you, you know, I think they talked about the whole kind of hiring aspect was added um, after the game had been out for a little while. Mm, yeah. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting thing that I, I wonder whether it was a, a strategy that they had thought of before. Or it was kind of afterwards. They said, look, well, we can update this application and we can add this in there um, and, 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 you know, use it to our advantage. I mean, they would have likely got a lot of press initially um, when their app first came out, whether their app had, you know, maybe their app wouldn't have gotten any traction, but had only gotten it from the mention of, of that kind of cool internal uh, secret feature, uh, which is, is, is not so much a secret now, but they're they're getting press now, and um, uh, they haven't said yet if they've hired anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, based on that, I mean, it'd be kind of funny to like, you know, you got get a high score, and then somehow you get a. Um, it's kind of like you remember that old movie, The Last Starfighter. Yep. And so they 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 made reference to it in the in the in the blog post that uh, we'll link to in the show notes where. Uh, you know, the guy sitting there playing the video game on that movie and then suddenly he gets a message that um, he's been recruited to, you know, fight for these this these uh, these guys in the Galactic Empire or whatever the heck it is that was going on in the movie. Um, and, you know, that's kind of funny to think that you might end up getting like a push message on your phone saying you've been recruited. We'd like to give you a job offer for Domino's Pizza. <laughs> yeah, and it actually it reminds me a little bit of a mobile marketing network that is really doing some innovative things. And I love the concept that they've got going, but it's keep. Have you heard of keep? Uh, I thought I did, but maybe not. So keep spelled K I I P because, ah, I think I call it Kip. Ah, okay. So I think it's supposed to be keep, but what keep does is it actually connects brands to gamers and allows them to give real world, prizes and offers in exchange for specific accomplishments or high scores in a game so let's say you're playing angry birds you get uh you know the three stars on every level you've really uh you've you've bested your score you're doing a great job 
they can actually capitalize on the excitement that you've got going on at that moment and say, hey, that, you know, great job. Doritos would like to send you a free bag of their new flaming Hot flavored Doritos to congratulate you for a job well done in Angry Birds. So it's connecting brands to consumers at a time when, one, they're very excited at having recently accomplished something, but two, also, you know, associating the brand with something unique, something interesting, and something tangible versus just a a banner ad that you'd see in most uh, mobile experiences. So I think connecting these real-world offers or real-world real products or real-world experiences to the social and digital and mobile space is a really interesting concept, and we're starting to see that take a number of forms. And Hopefully, we'll see more of that in the future because I think it's really something unique and something that consumers would get a lot of value out of and therefore you know, not try to avoid. They're not going to go out of their way to not click on it or not use it like a banner ad. They're going to actually be looking for things and saying, oh, where's my next you know, offer? What brand is going to capitalize on this high score leaderboard next and um, you know, really unlocks that relationship? Uh, just to kind of side note something to take a look at. Is uh, are the uh, comments for the post that we'll end up linking to, uh, because there's uh, quite an interesting case for you know a lot of people get worried about negative comments and um, that by being engaged in social media, having a blog, for instance, with comments at the bottom, that you're opening up yourself for 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 folks to you know slander you or say bad things about your brand or whatever the case may be. Uh, and I found it really interesting in the in the comments how. One person seemed to just really dislike Domino's and voice their opinion with probably a mini blog post of their own there. Um, and uh, then the, the conversation ensued with a lot of folks who actually came to the defense of Domino's talking about, you know, their experience with it. And especially after the the fact that in the last year, you know, Domino's is, has really um, done a lot in social media and on uh, TV commercials and so on to prove and, and communicate with folks that they've, they've in fact – felt their, um, uh, listened to their feedback and made changes to their product because of that feedback. And so I, I think you should check out the, the comments and see um, what really can happen if you kind of sit back and give folks a chance to converse um, and how something negative can turn into actually a really interesting and positive uh, discussion if you're doing the right thing at, uh, with your brand or business. Yeah, definitely something to check out. So, Adam, sadly, no one has taken us up on the offer to buy the Solo Mo Show for $1 billion. But the billion dollar sale of Instagram has actually sparked a number of uh, interesting kind of spin off industries and, and interest in other things that could potentially be the next Instagram. So, of course, this, the second something becomes a billion dollar product and sells out to Facebook, We've already moved on to the next thing, and we're like, ah, oh, photos are over. Let's let's find out what's uh, you know what's cool this week. And it looks like what uh, has caught the attention of the online world is mobile video, and not mobile video in the typical sense of you know being able to access YouTube on your smartphone, but actually creating short mobile video clips and sharing those through a mobile network and. Very similar way to how Instagram kind of altered the photo space and then created a network around it. So we've got two different services that have um, kind of made a name for themselves recently. There's Social Cam and Vidi. And uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is it Vidi or Vidly? Is it? I know. I think you're, I think, yeah, you're right. Vidi. Vidi, which. Terrible name, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so so both of these were in the news recently. Social Cam was in the news because they actually had a post on Y Combinator's site asking for basically help to build this product. So apparently, it's like two or three guys in a garage, but in a single weekend, they added three million new users, which is the type of growth that we were seeing with Instagram. And so now we're starting to see it with some of these mobile video sharing sites, which is kind of interesting. And it's a very similar story to the Instagram folks. It's a very small team and they're using a lot of these cloud technologies to grow and scale their business. But, you know, just the fact that they're adding millions of users in a very short time frame means that 
there's there's something going on here. There's something interesting. And then Vidi, the terribly named mobile startup, uh, actually announced that it had raised a round of funding. And this round of funding was backed by a number of Hollywood celebrities or the investment trusts that are backed by Hollywood celebrities and well-known VC companies and you know, basically a lot of the who's who in terms of what people pay attention to when they start putting money behind something have invested in this service. Um, and again, very similar to Instagram, you can shoot these little video snippets, you can apply filters to it, you can share that with your audience. So just wanted to get your take on this trend of short mobile video sharing. And if you think that it's here to stay, or is it just sort of riding the wave of popularity that Instagram has created? Uh, you know, I I'd signed up for both of those services when they first came out. I mean, we always often discuss being kind of early adopters of these things and and being in there really early and trying them out. Uh, I, I had signed up for both of them, and uh, I had to say that you know, social cam, for instance, was was a bit underwhelming, and so was Viddy, in fact. Um, and I found it interesting to suddenly see them talked about and and this you know because they're now all kind of in the in the press regarding social media um in the social media press excuse me um about these these uh these two apps specifically social cam because it seems to be really just exploding and you know that's an it's an offshoot product from another video um uh company or startup out there called Justin TV. And so it really was kind of like this side project and I think that's why their team kind of unexpectedly now needs to to scale but um, I mean, it, I knew I knew something like this was going to eventually take off, but and, and video has been you know kind of said to be the growing thing for five or six years. I mean, ever since uh, ever since YouTube um, was was out, everybody thought, okay, great, video is going to be the next big thing. Uh, I don't necessarily know what that means because video is is really big right now, and I think um, we're seeing it kind of I guess evolve now to being something that can can be uh, a feature over top. Like, for instance, who says that Foursquare can actually now also have, I don't know, a video of, of something attached to it as well. It's a feature now that's being added onto everything else. Um, but with social cam, it seems to really, it's the behavior that was trained uh, or that was ingrained in people with the popularity of Instagram really kind of kind of oozing on over to folks now with the, with video because now they have something uh, to relate to so a familiarity with the way that the interface works and the same sort of mechanics, um, the, the ability to take that content and cross post it elsewhere. And I think that's the most compelling reason for brands to be able to use it is not necessarily just to look at what can I do with this community on its own inside that applica- inside the, the social cam community, but also the fact that you can also, again, just still use it as a way to cross pro- uh, post and, and, and cross pollinate your content elsewhere. So to say Facebook and, and to Twitter. Um, so in re- I revisited it today, to be honest, I hadn't looked at it in quite some time. I revisited it today and, and found the community to really, um, evolved <laughs> quite a bit. And, um, I kind of lean in the direction of social cam versus video because social cam actually allows for longer form videos. So you don't have to feel restricted where video is more, it's like 15 seconds and that's it. Hmm. What do you think? I mean, that's an interesting discussion because part of what made Instagram successful is that it did pose restrictions on the type of content you could share. So you had to create these square images. You could only use a certain number of filters. It, It kind of created its own aesthetic. And so I think that's probably what they're trying to get at is, and it goes all the way back to when Twitter first came out and people are like, Oh, you know, there's, there's not enough here. I need more characters. Then it was like, well, this limited number of characters actually kind of forces you to create certain types of content and to really cater your interaction to the network. And then Instagram came out and did the same thing. You sort of catered the types of photos that you were sharing to the network and um so they're they're using that formula and whether or not that formula is the cause or the effect of the network whether limiting the types of things people can share causes them to share better things or if the network just happens to be popular and people adapt i think that's up for debate um but it is sort of you know interesting to say well 
do people just want to share video of any length or do they want to expand on a photo a little bit and give it some motion and context, but not so much that they want to be creating two and three minute videos that would go on something like YouTube. Well, I mean, what do you think of the applications? I mean, how would, how would you recommend a a business or a brand use, uh, use one of the apps? Um, I mean, to be honest, it feels a little, early to be giving these things the valuations that they're seeing so Viddy raised uh whatever they're they raised like a ridiculous amount of money but they raised it at a 300 million dollar valuation so for a company that has no existing way of making revenue it seems like it, a lot of investors might just be hoping that this is the next thing that facebook buys for a billion dollars without thinking about the fact that the reason Instagram got bought for that was the network and that you can't just create that network overnight. It took, you know, 18 months for Instagram to do it and it might take longer for a video network to do it. I'd say if you're a marketer that wants to get involved in sharing social video and, you know, we always say always be experimenting. So uh, there's no reason to not be at least testing these out and getting comfortable with what types of content you'd want to share with video, but, you know, really trying to tell that story in an interesting way. Um, you know, I think it is, I prefer the ones that kind of give you a very limited window to record. So you're not making this very long movie. You're really more making a, almost like a video tweet, I think that's probably the direction that I'd prefer to go just because it it gives you creativity within a fixed box. So you have you have the constraints and you say, OK, well, I, I know the limits of what I can do. So now I need to just be creative within this within this foundation. Um, but, you know, finding maybe it's uh, maybe you start off with something as simple as taking something that you'd normally share via a Twitter update and and just speaking that into the camera and using it as a, a video based messaging system. Um, or, you know, I think especially for companies that have either physical store spaces or warehouses or retail space or anything that has kind of a, a hustle and bustle going on, sharing a look at that so that people that aren't there in that physical space can still get a feel for the brand and get a feel for the company and, and what it might be like to be in that location. I think that's probably an interesting direction to go with something like this. Um, you know, I think there's a number of probably memes that we'll see evolve. And so it, being involved in that network early on gives you inside access to seeing the types of content that does trend and does do well in that network. So that's an advantage of jumping in there early. Um, uh, what about you, Adam? What would you recommend as a couple of first steps to testing the waters of social video? You know, I think your suggestions actually are, are, are spot on. And, you know, if you look at it and say, well, how would I um, – what, what would I want to communicate? I mean, I think that's a good word. Communicate via a tweet or via a photo that I was sharing on Twitter um, or, or say even with Instagram or something and thinking of, you know, there's those – there's the limitations to that due to 140 characters and so on so what would uh, how could I take that same stuff that I've tweeted before and shared via Twitter before and translate that into kind of a really compact short video um, I, I think so one of the folks that I saw on, on social cam is a, is a journalist and I, I saw her recently sharing these uh, I don't know they were like a minute to a minute and a half maybe even two minute long videos of her interviewing somebody just kind of in that person's headquarters and just talking to him and then she had broken it up into video one two three and four um and i just kind of thought it was a little awkward because i thought it was great content that didn't shouldn't have been trapped in social cam Hmm. does that make sense um that when you put it in social cam in a way you've now kind of put it in social cam it's within that community you can share it on twitter and you can share it on facebook but uh it, it it could have also it could have been something that was really um, like posted on Twitter. I mean, excuse me, YouTube, for instance. Yeah, uh, which had a lot of eyeballs, a lot of traffic, a lot of people who would likely be interested in something that, although it was only say two minutes long, it still felt a little bit more like longer form content, just broken into a few different bite sized pieces. 
Um, and so when you say, hey, it's better to have some of that, some of those restrictions, I'm kind of in the middle. I think it's great to have the ability to put something up there for as long as, say, a minute, um, but uh, and, and not 15 seconds because it just seems to kind of go by too quickly uh, when you are showing some stuff off. Some things can be really communicated in 15 seconds, but I think there's a lot to be desired. But the, the, I think identifying that when some content might actually live better on a site like YouTube versus uh, versus directly on to social cam. But who's to say that you couldn't take those videos? And in fact, she may be doing this. Those videos initially could be on your device and you just happen to use social cam as an as a, as an alternative place or an additional place in addition to YouTube or even Facebook video or something like that, that you're ending up to, uh, that, that you end up uh, sharing this content. So think of it potentially as another avenue for sharing uh, smaller bits and pieces of video content that you already have. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a good first step. And for brands that are creating video content, if you're already taking the time and taking the effort to think, okay, how do I tell a story with video? There's no reason to say, okay, well, how do I take that video and either format it to fit this new channel or maybe just trim it down and make it work? Uh, I think that's probably a lot of how brands were successful early on getting up and running on Instagram was rather than creating content specifically for Instagram, it was saying, okay, well, while I'm creating all of this other content, how do I shave some off for the Instagram community as well and make sure that it's relevant to that channel? Yep. And speaking of relevant, there was a fantastic campaign that I came across for Pinterest that I wanted to share because I felt like the brand that put this out whoever was behind it, they just understood Pinterest and they were like, look, we've, we've figured out this campaign. We're going to go out there. We're going to try something. If it works, it's going to work really well. Uh, and in my opinion, it's, it's an initial sort of one of the, one of the first campaigns that I'm looking at as just really getting the most out of Pinterest. So it was put on by Honda um, and I think this is Honda US. It's a little hard to tell. They've got a couple of different Pinterest accounts. So I think this is their Honda US. But what it is, it was called the Pinter Mission Campaign. And so realizing that Pinterest is this thing that people are already talking about having an addiction to and saying, oh, I, I can't stop. I'm always checking Pinterest. I want to see what the newest stuff is. I'm pinning new stuff. They said, okay, well, you know, that's great, but sometimes you got to take a pinter mission and go out and actually enjoy the world. And then for them, that meant, uh, you know, hopping in their new CRV and using that to go explore the world. But, you know, leaving, leaving that part of it aside, I think it was just interesting to say, okay, you know, we all love spending time online, but sometimes you got to get offline. Sometimes you got to go out there and explore and our brand happens to help you do that. So what they did is they created these personal invitation pin images. I guess that's probably the best way to describe it. It was basically images that looked like sort of a scrapbook or a collage of different things, which really fits well into the overall Pinterest aesthetic. And then they found some of the top users that are the most followed on Pinterest, the most active, they're pinning things on a daily basis. And they tagged them with these posts and basically said, look, we're going to put this offer out and if you accept the offer you have to stay off of pinterest for 24 hours but in exchange we'll give you 500 dollars to go use to explore the real world and go have some sort of adventure or go do you know something that you've likely been pinning about but maybe haven't actually had a chance to go do in real life um and so they created these group boards and um, Adam, you were mentioning, which I think is spot on. It looks like they actually used the Pinterest uh, kind of hack. And I, I say that in air quotes, but this Pinterest hack where you can add somebody to a group board and it just automatically makes them part of that board before they have a chance to either accept or deny. There is no accept or deny. It just makes them a member of that board. And then if they want to, they can remove themselves. So they created these group boards for a number of popular members shared this image and then said, hey, if you take us up on this offer, just pin the results of this day spent off of Pinterest. Um, and really just an interesting use of the network and connecting with some of the early influencers on Pinterest and 
understanding the look and feel of a of Pinterest content and creating original content that does well to engage that audience. I thought it brought together a lot of just best practices for engaging with the Pinterest audience as a brand. Yeah, I, I thought it was. Uh, I think every every single every single week <laughs> we seem to be finding somebody. Uh, using Pinterest for more and more um, interesting and creative ways, and I think creative is the the appropriate term because folks are not necessarily, you know, they're not using some API and creating some application with it or any of that. They're really using what's available uh, from within the features of Pinterest and, uh, and and just being really creative with how they're um, how they're using it, the messaging that they have to to try to you know make sure that they guide people through an experience that they're facilitating using Pinterest, I think months and months ago, not months and months ago, but a couple months ago when there was a South by Southwest, uh, there was the, uh, it was the ad agency that ended up creating kind of a, a web page that linked to the various boards in order to show people around Texas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and then there was, I forgot what there, there's been a, a couple of them. It's kind of just evolved, um, as, as folks have taken advantage of the, the popularity of Pinterest, to kind of say, how can we look at this medium in a different way and really use it to our advantage? Um, and so I thought it was ingenious. Um, you know, they they had to have done their homework in order to also find the influencers that they connected with. Because if you take a look at the uh, the folks that they reached out to, those folks had, I mean, many of them had between. 50 and uh, 50,000 and one person had like 700,000 people following them on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. um, so they really did some research ahead of time in order to find out, well, who are those influencers and, and who, who's going to make the biggest impact if they, um, if they get involved with this particular campaign. Um, so again, similar to the one with Kotex a couple months ago, that's the other one or a couple weeks ago where they were doing the same thing. They were looking for, influencers on there that had a lot of followers who were very, very active, who had a lot of repins and so on and said, look, how can we engage with these specific individuals uh, and get them to engage with our brand and things that we want to uh, the messaging that we want to get out there via Pinterest rather than simply saying, we're going to have a bunch of boards and we're going to try to see if we can get a bunch of people to follow us. Yeah, I think that's definitely great. A lot of brands have sort of tried to crack the code for how do we engage influencers? How do we get them interested in our brand? And I think what Honda's done and what, what a lot of brands could follow their lead on is using Pinterest as a way of identifying exactly what these influencers are interested in, because whether it's they've created a entire board for it, or they just have pinned a lot of things around a specific topic that really shows the type of content that this person is interested in. And so for Honda, each one of these invitations actually included a few sample posts that they said, you know, maybe it's this backpack that you pinned, or maybe it's this destination that you had pinned a few months back. And so it showed that they had gone through these people's profiles. They tried to understand what makes these people tick and really relate their content and their offer to that influencer's interests, which is, going to drastically increase the likelihood of that person responding positively and saying, Hey, you know what? It feels like you put some time and effort into this. Maybe I will take you up on that offer and, uh, you know, become involved in this campaign. So definitely, uh, a great example of engaging with influencers and then also taking that extra step and not only offering something to the influencers, but for other users that come across this campaign and say, you know, Hey, well, I want to take a pinner mission too. So they created a number of images that people can repin to take their own Pinter mission. And it caters to specific popular topics within Pinterest. So there's one for the person that talks about cooking a lot. There's a, you know, a message that says, I can't cook because I'm out, uh, you know, living the real living in the real world for a day and taking a Pinter mission sponsored by Honda. And just really interesting content that is provided for users who come across this campaign and say, hey, I, I want to get involved. I want to do that as well. And, you know, maybe the $500 offer isn't there, but they can still at least feel like, oh, I'm, I'm part of this movement to take a Pinter mission. I thought that was really interesting. 
Yeah, so we'll have that in our our show notes, and I really recommend that you check it out because it's uh, it's it's a extremely interesting use for Pinterest. Um, and you know, I, I'd say take a look at also the reactions that that folks get within uh, each of their their boards, the group boards that were uh, shared. And there's you know other folks come in that were following uh, either Honda or primarily probably following. Uh, each of the the Pinterest users, these influential Pinterest users, and the kind of you know reaction that um, th- that they received from uh, from that campaign. Yeah. So, speaking of interesting uses for an existing social media tool or technology that people feel like, hey, I already understand that, but maybe there's brands out there doing unique things. We had challenged the audience with coming up with some unique uses of the Facebook timeline last week. And so I thought we'd follow up this week with a couple of those interesting Facebook timelines that we came across and just use it as sort of a an inspiration moment for those people that are out there saying, hey, I've got this, I've got this timeline outside of the ordinary. What could I do with it that would be unique and really grab people's attention? So what do you say we run through a couple of those? Let's go for it. You got the list. I don't, so it'll surprise me as well. (laughs) All right. So first up was actually done by an agency, and it was a smaller agency out of California called The Engine is Red. Um, And I think it's a a reference to fire trucks, but they were actually responding to an RFP or a request for proposal from uh, North Lake Tahoe. And so what they did, which I thought was really interesting, is they said, okay, well, as we're getting up to speed on North Lake Tahoe, let's just take a trip out there. Let's go experience this thing. And we'll document that experience inside of a Facebook timeline. And so the proposal that they actually then delivered to to their potential client was a Facebook timeline. They had photos in there. They had stories they had things that they were learning about the area um it was available both as a very specific facebook page so they created a facebook page they used all the functionality to uh create a functioning timeline that the client could click through and and view all of the different things that they came across while they were exploring this area they also created a pdf that used the facebook timeline look and feel to kind of layout content so you know they were like oh we want to describe our creative team and so each one of the people created their own little mock facebook profile that included information about them and how they would be helping out on the campaign so a really just interesting use of the timeline aesthetic as a way of telling a story and bringing together a bunch of different types of content into one experience i thought that was really great um, another quick one was Livestrong. So the Livestrong Foundation is, uh, you know, closely tied to cancer research and has really owned the color yellow. And so you go onto this page and there's just a ton of yellow. But what I thought was really interesting is that they took the founded date, which is sort of the very first thing that you can enter into your Facebook timeline, and it establishes the end of your timeline, basically. So if a user scrolls through all of their content, everything, they get to the very bottom, they end up on this founded image. And so what Livestrong did is actually carried the aesthetic that they started in their cover photo down through this, um, what could I guess essentially be called the footer of your Facebook page. It's the last thing that people come across. And so they've got this yellow stripe and it actually starts in the cover photo It goes through some of their application icons, which I thought was really interesting. And then it kind of concludes in this uh, in this founded image. And so it really makes the page feel like it's all cohesive. It's got a very strong aesthetic that carries through throughout the timeline. And I thought that was just an example of positioning content in an interesting way so that it all ties together and it it kind of turns everything into a single story. That was uh, an interesting use. And then finally, Fanta, the soda company, used Facebook Timeline to create kind of a hide-and-seek game, which was really interesting. And I wish that I could have found a better case study for this, because you can you can play around with it and you can see the end result, but a lot of the content that they originally put out there has changed as a result of their fans interacting with this. But they would basically put clues as to where these various characters that they had created 
had traveled back in time to. So they would, you know, they'd have a disco ball and they'd say, oh, this character is stuck in the 70s. And so you had to actually go find this uh, this image that they had dropped into the 1970s portion of their timeline like that image and then if enough people liked it it would sort of rescue that character from that from that date and bring them back into the current timeline and so <laughs> kind of added a lot of really interesting game elements and you know incentivize people to like the page and um really just an interesting use of a couple of well-placed images and a lot of creative and crafty content to get people to scroll around within the timeline and like pieces of content and feel engaged by the brand outside of just the traditional, you know, Hey, we've got a poll and we're really excited to get your answer. I think after a while, consumers kind of get bored with that and just catching them off guard with something like this goes a long way towards them wanting to return to the Fanta page and say, all right, well, you know, what's next? I'm excited by what you're doing. I, I appreciate that you've created this game element for me and, you know, now you've kind of got a, a long-term fan, so let's continue that engagement. I thought that was a really interesting use and and sort of gamified the Facebook timeline, which I hadn't seen done before. So three great examples, you know, I think three very different uses for the timeline, and hopefully one of those or maybe a combination of those will spark an idea in your own marketing plan and you know, maybe uh, maybe we'll feature you on a future solo mo show. So if you do create something interesting with the Facebook timeline, let us know, and we'd love to highlight it and talk about it on the show as well. You know, and the the underlying theme with that, and and all the things that we've talked about with Pinterest and and, and uh, some of the uh, well, plenty of other things in the past are um, is to not take any of these tools at face value. That they are, um, you know, tools uh, and, uh, and and channels for communicating things and so on. Uh, and that really the the special stuff happens when you think creatively on how to use them out of the box. And, you know, those three examples that you just talked about are, are great examples of how people um, said, what is possible? What, what is what is it that we can do here uh, that will just be really different and fun and, and, and engaging um, beyond just posting you know, content and posting photos or videos or status updates. Um, and so I really encourage folks to, when they go back and they have a meeting and say, what can we do with Facebook or what can we do with Twitter? What can we do with even all of them combined to think about um, something out of the box and to be a bit more creative than simply saying, oh, well, we could share this and we can continue to share that and and we can just post slide decks and other great, you know, other content that we have available. We're just going to take all of that and just push it out to people. Uh, so, so think a little bit more creatively um, beyond that like these guys have. These are great examples. Definitely, definitely. All right. Well, what do we say? We call that a wrap, Adam. I think that's been a a solid hour of hopefully inspiring and creative content. Yes, let's do it. All right. So as always, we want to thank the audience. We really appreciate you guys for listening to the show, both live and pre-recorded. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this episode and have a chance to go back and check out some of the other episodes as well. If you'd like to get in touch, we'd appreciate that. We're always happy to hear from the listeners. Uh, there's a number of ways to do that. So first off, you can reach us on Twitter. Uh, it's either at Solo Mo Show, and that reaches both Adam or I. Or you can contact us directly. I'm available at Corey O'Brien. And I'm at Secret Sushi. We have pages on Facebook, Google+, and a set of boards on Pinterest. So if you're users of any of those channels, just go ahead and search for us. I know that facebook.com slash Solo Mo Show will get you there. And then I think on Google Plus and Pinterest, you just got to do a little bit of searching, but hopefully it's not too hard to find. Uh, and then if you want, you can also email us. We're happy to contact via email. It's Solo Mo Show at gmail.com. So feel free to reach out with any questions you might have, suggested topics for future shows, links you want to get our opinion on, feedback you've got for the show, or even just to say hi. We definitely appreciate getting to know you a little bit better, hear what you're interested in, hear your thoughts about uh, marketing and advertising, and you know how we could make this podcast better suit your needs. Um, and then as always, all the links that we discussed today, as well as the links to all the various social channels that we just mentioned, can be found in the show notes. And you can view those either at solomoshow.com 
or they should show up in your podcast player of choice. So whether you're listening on the desktop or on your phone, there should be an option in your podcast player to view show notes. And if there's not, I recommend you get a better podcast player because there's plenty out there that feature (laughs) the show note capability and it really enhances listening to the podcast. You can click along to the links as uh, we're talking about them. We actually have an enhanced podcast, so there should be images that you're able to view that sort of relate to the things we're talking about as well. So having a good podcast player will definitely help you to get the most out of this show. Um, And then just a quick reminder that if you are subscribed via RSS to make sure that you have the proper RSS feed, we updated it recently, so it should be now going through FeedBurner. So make sure you've got the FeedBurner RSS activated And finally, one small ask. If you like the show, we would greatly appreciate it if you could spend a couple minutes and just give it a quick rating on iTunes, even if that just means clicking and giving it a certain number of stars based on how good you think we are at educating you on the solo mo. We would definitely appreciate it, and hopefully we've uh, we've created a good show for you and you appreciate the content and, you know, give us a high rating in response to that, but... Uh, helping rate it on iTunes helps us to get the word out there, helps us to build the audience and, you know, really just makes the show even that much more better. So we would definitely appreciate that. Uh, and with that, we will see you guys next week with a new round of links and hopefully some more engaging discussion. Take care.